Uh, it's a great Sunday morning. We're so grateful for our graduates. Now, one of the things that we, we failed to do was uh, there's some of you out there who've been mentors of our graduates. If you served as a mentor with our graduates, would you stand? These are people who've had relationships with our uh, kids who graduated. We have any of our mentors here today. Would you stand up? Back here, I see some. Here, let's, let's give a hand to the mentors. These are, these are men and women who um, wanted to make a difference in the lives of, of our teenagers. They wanted to be there, not, just, not as surrogate parents, but as those who encourage, who come alongside and say, you matter, you're so important. Now, one of the other things we, we've celebrated the graduate students, I, I am aware, too, of uh, you know, almost a year ago, uh, Luke Logan died. And he would have graduated. He would have stood on stage. And I know for the Logan family and for those who know, knew Luke well, this is a tough Sunday. And one of the things I want to say as I reflect on that is this. I am grateful for those in this church who, when the Logan family went through that crisis, stepped toward them and said, we love you. And I'm also grateful that there are people in that family who recognize there are no words we can say to make that hurt go away. But we love that family, and that family is so important to us, and I'm very, very grateful, and I miss Luke and his giftedness, and I missed him today on stage. But I want to say this too, I'm so grateful for you guys and the way you've been using your lives to honor Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing that is. But I also want to say something to this church, Wednesday night, and we had some of our teenagers, some of the graduates there uh, at the Tennessee School for the Blind. A lot of you showed up and made that a special night for those students at the Tennessee School for the Blind, and I want to thank you for that. It meant so much to see young and old, and we had some really young kids that are kids up there and working with their kids, and uh, I, I just, it means so much to, to be a part of a family like this who goes... It's not just about us. There are those that God has called us to love and to care for and to reach out to, and what a blessing it is to be a part of Madison. Now, I'm not going to talk long, and at the end of my sermon, we're going to focus on the Lord's Supper, but, so it really can't be called a sermon, but I do have a word that I think is really important, but it's not my word. It's a word we find in Scripture. And I want to first read Psalm 12 to you, and then I want to talk a little bit about why I chose this psalm. I think it's an important psalm. On a day like today, we're looking at graduates, but not just as graduates, the larger family that you grow up in. I mean, it's so easy to think of, and it should be, that your family of origin is your family. But when you're a part of a church, you look around and you go, this is my family too. Some I don't know very well, but let me just tell you, there were some kind of family gatherings in the Corley Lankas family. I'm kind of going, now, who are you? And so that kind of happens even in places where you're supposed to know these family reunions. Sometimes people look a little strange. But let me read to you Psalm chapter 12, and I want to talk briefly about it. It says, Help, Lord, for no one is faithful anymore. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. Everyone lies to their neighbor. They flatter with their lips but harbor deception in their hearts. May the Lord silence all flattering lips and every boastful tongue those who say, by our tongues we will prevail, our own lips will defend us, who is Lord over us? Because the poor are plundered and the greedy groan, I will now rise, says Yahweh. I will protect them from those who malign them. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. You, Yahweh, will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked who freely strut about and what is vile is honored by the human race. Now, I know some of you kind of going, Russ, why that psalm? That's not really a happy psalm. It's not one of those kind of really kind of encouraging psalms. Why would you pick that? Well, this is the reason I pick it. As David looked around in his world, he see, saw what very, so many of us see in our world, and that is we live in a world not being directed by the Word of God that is true and faithful and dependable, but instead a world that's being shaped by lies and flattery and boasting and deception. 
And growing up in this world, you got to make a choice. Who are we going to listen to? And who's going to shape the way we speak and live in this world? Look, it's a very good chance that this psalm came early in his David's life. He's probably a little bit older than you guys. But when he was about your age, he was fighting a giant named Goliath. He wasn't going thinking, well, well this is going to be my college career. Instead, he was being called out, taking care of sheep, and he was fighting a giant that no one else wanted to face. And he became so successful that the king that he'd helped rescue in killing that giant began to hate him. And the king's advisors saw the king's hatred of him, and everyone was talking lies and deception about David and flattering Saul. And next thing you know, David's having to leave and he's fleeing. He doesn't get to go to a nice college dorm room where it's safe. Instead, where he ends up is living in caves, trying to escape the king. And all those who are saying evil, ugly things and planning against him, even though he's God's man. That's how bad the world can be. The world can be so alienated against God, there is no perception of what God is doing. It has no room in its heart to hear what God is saying. It doesn't care because so many in the world today, and we live in a flattering world, you don't just have to turn to the politicians. You can turn all around where people say anything that is needed to say so their lives go better. It doesn't matter if it's true. It just matters if it works. And David contrasts that that's going on in the world that's so upsetting. He's going, it's even influencing God's people. He says, no one is faithful anymore. That's the way it feels to him. But God speaks, and God says, I care about the poor, and I care about the needy, and I care about those who are taken advantage of and abused by the lies and the deception and the boasting of those who are in power. It's the poor and the needy. I care about them. And then David reflects on God's word and said, God's word is true. God's word is refined. God's word is pure. God's word is not a lying word. God's word is a truth spoken into the world of falseness and deception. Can you hear God's word? And when you get to the end of the psalm, the situation's not changed. The evil people are still prancing around, feeling so glorious in comparison to God. But David is now able to face that world with confidence. He's not going to face that world based on the starting point of that world. Instead, what he's going to do is he's going to be a man of truth and integrity. And here's the warning about David's life. If he's writing this psalm early in his life, when he becomes a man a little bit younger than I am right now, he has become a man of lies and flattering lips. And he gets involved with Bathsheba, and he arranges a deceptive situation that takes a man's life because he wants that woman so much. And his kingdom begins to crumble because he, in that moment's life, is not listening. You see, this psalm is not just for our graduates. It's for all of us because when we live in a society where people flatter and lie and boast about themselves and post their accomplishments and all that and think that that's the most important thing, however I can prop myself up and look good to people, that's not the thing that matters most, is it? The thing that matters most is this, can I hear God's word and will I build my life around God's word? Will I become a person of God's word so that God's living, true, golden word resonates in my heart and speaks when my mouth opens? And where do we hear that word? Well, John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You want to hear God's word in its most pure and elegant form? Do you want to see God's word embodied and lived? You go to Jesus. And look, Jesus' words began to talk about a place called the cross. And when he spoke the truth about what was in his future, he had his helpers go, oh, no, no, you're so great, you can't go there. No, 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 that's not. And he rebukes them because they don't have in mind the things of God, the Word of God. Instead, they've got their plans. Their plans seem so good to them. Their plans seem so right to them. Their plans are all glowy to them. But Jesus goes, no, I've come to die. And the flattering and evil people in that culture and that society were conspiring against him, and they thought that the cross was all about how great they were, and they were boastful about that, but that was not true. 
The cross is about a word of God who says, yes, you're made in my image and I love you, but you have rebelled against me. And I'm a holy God as much as I am a loving God, and I'm going to do something to deal with this. And so his son was true to the word and went to the cross, but that was not the final word. Because on the third day, God raised Jesus. The thing that validates that his word is different than my word or your word, his word is rooted in the words of the Father, and the words they speak are true, and the Spirit of God works with that word and brings people to life. And every Sunday, we do something very special. And I want those who are going to be serving communion to go ahead and get ready. I'm getting close. We do something. If you're not careful, the words in your head go, oh, well, it's just a piece of bread and juice, and, well, nothing very interesting happened today. Hmm, okay, I'll go ahead and do it. I'll go through the motions. If you allow the word of Jesus Christ to be in your heart, not the things that books will say about the Lord's Supper, about church, all that kind of stuff. I don't care about all that. I don't care about the countless words that are being written by good Christian people. That's really not important. Here is what is important. Jesus sat with people like you, and he said, take this bread, and when you share this bread, I want you to remember me. And he connected with what? With the cross the body crucified. And he says, this cup, when you take this cup, hear my word. When you take this cup, I want you to take this cup in remembrance of me. When Paul reflected on this simple thing, full of meaning because of the living word of Jesus Christ, when Paul takes it, he goes, every time we take this, what are we doing? We're not only remembering Jesus' death, we do remember that, but we are recalling the reality of his resurrection. Death is not the final word, and it is a brutal word. It's not the final word. And, and the word of God speaking through Paul says, we take this, and when we take this bread, we do what? It is a word in action. We proclaim him as Lord of our lives until he comes again. I believe that is true. That's why we do this simple thing every Sunday morning, and it is filled with the meaning of the Father and Son, and I pray that the Holy Spirit this morning will bless us as we take the bread, will bless us as we take the cup, and I pray this, can you look around you today? Not just look on yourself. Look around you today. I told the graduates, this is part of your family. As you take the bread and cup, can you look around today? Christ died for us. Christ is risen for us. And Christ is going to call us together on that great day as his family to be with him. He has prepared a banquet for us. And this is just a small taste of what he has in store for us. Would you bow with me so we can pray? God, I look at the men and women gathered in this room today. As Nathan said, we are created in your image, but we also know we have been sinful. There are times the words of our mouth have not been true words. They've been flattering words. At times have been boasting words. Oh, God, forgive us for that. We look to the cross for forgiveness, past, present, future. We have forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Oh, dear God. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with deep hope and that longing expectation of the return of Jesus as we take this bread that reminds us of the body of Jesus, risen, died and risen. As we partake of this cup, reminding us of that blood shed that also cleanses us. Oh, God, help us not to trivialize what we're about to do together as a family. Help us to see in the bread and the cup Jesus, help us see in taking this together, family, and help us to do this with hope because there's some here today grieving. Help us to do this thing with faith, with hope, and with love. In Jesus' name we pray.